want to make something very clear before I start. The following presentation, which I've called The Six Tenets of Ethnonationalism, simply stem from my own opinion, worldview, and my very own musings on the topic. This is in no way, shape, or form an absolute on the ideas or ideologies. Your opinion may vary, and I would appreciate any contribution to the discussion that you may have. The six tenets of ethno-nationalism could also be referred to as the six axioms of ethno-nationalism, statements that I generally hold to be true and that help determine my outlook on life as far as politics, religion, and society is concerned. There's no definite way to call these the principles of ethno-nationalism or anything like that. I simply lack the ego to make such an absolutist statement on the subject. With that out of the way, let's begin. I want to make something else clear here. These six tenets build upon one another. To understand three, you must understand one and two. To understand six, you must understand one, two, three, four, and five. They're not independent. They are completely connected with one another, and I use each one as a building block to the next step. Number one, the human condition is biologically motivated. Your wants, needs, desires are a part of an endlessly complex set of chemicals that are interacting and changing with one another. Your motivations, appearance, and behavior, and even physical ability, is mostly determined by nature. From this scientific and naturalistic worldview, we have come to understand mankind. While I cannot deny that there is obviously an environmental impact on people's behavior and what exact language they're going to speak and some of their physical characteristics, and of course, the environment that they're raised in, whether they have two parents in the households and things like this, does obviously affect you. There is, however, an underlying genetic component to all of these behaviors and ways of life. The way that you think, the way that you look, the way that your body interacts with its environment, there exists even a harmonious balance between nature and genetics and how they play off of one another. Of course, we understand this as the genetic clustering of humans over long periods of time in geographically separated regions. Tenant number two, conflict is an inevitable part of nature and is a key part of all creatures' natural motivations. Humans have developed a particular strategy for survival that seeks to reduce conflict and promote survival. The strategy evolved in our forebears and remains with us today. In other words, humans have created the semi-abstract concept of society in order to reduce conflict and again promote survival. Social norms like behavioral patterns, religion, language, politics, etc. have all been created and maintained by humans in order to promote unity, which in turn reduces conflict, which again in turn promotes productivity, which allows for survival and eventually, in our modern view, self-actualization, happiness, and fulfillment. A very long time ago in our evolutionary past, groups of humans, or proto-humans, determined that by working together you could become more productive, that you could subdue nature easily and promote the survival of your species, which, as we understand from our naturalist and scientific worldview, is simply a part of our biological motivation for survival. In doing this, we have created these social norms that help maintain the chaos that are animals such as humans. We are not outside the realm of animal behavior, but we have created society in order to subdue this and harmonize our relationship with nature and our inner animal spirits. There is a reason why we share certain behavioral patterns, why we look down upon things like incest and murder and rape and theft. These do not promote the survival of the species. These are not productive activities, and while we must not encourage these things to happen. More on this later. Tenant number three builds upon the concepts of tenant number two, in the idea that humans have also created and nurtured the abstract concept of identity and in-group preference. This serves the same conflict resolution and survival promoting evolutionary strategies as the society and social norms. Unity amongst a people, tribe, or nation is a self-defense mechanism from outsiders who may not serve the best interests of the group. Whether it's the introduction of bad genes, disease, or conflict into our society, the risk is never worth it. Identity can span from the smallest groups, 
the family, all the way to much larger concepts such as the nation. This promotes your survival. For example, men and women must come together and embrace their identity as a cohesive family unit in order to promote the creation of children and the successful upbringing of these children. Your identity as a mother or your identity as a father is a key part of maintaining our society from the most essential element, which is the family unit. But your identity extends much further than that. It extends to your tribe, to your nation, or even to your racial group. This promotes, again, unity amongst a people and reduces the probability of internal conflict amongst a group. This does not mean that there will never be conflict or somehow this will resolve all issues. No, as we understand in Tenets 1 and 2, humans and human societies are not outside the realm of nature and outside the realms of conflict. There will always be these types of things, whether it's on the smallest possible levels, a dispute between two friends, or on the biggest possible level, a war between nations. This conflict will always exist. But to say that we should not minimize this as much as possible by embracing our identities and our mutual respect for one another is ridiculous. Building on this, we reach tenant number four. The power of the collective is immeasurably stronger than the individual. And let me clarify, I'm in no way, shape, or form promoting this collectivist or collectivism ideal. I am simply stating a fact of reality that collective consciousness will always be stronger than the individual, whether it's in, again, the smallest units. If you look at group projects at work or in school, the fact that you can divide the workload amongst multiple capable persons allows work to be done easier. It allows you to be more productive. Now, if you extend that to a nation, you begin to understand that a collective consciousness among society or the nation allows us to produce great things, allows us to equally bear the burdens of existence itself, which is conflict and suffering and so on and so forth. While we should recognize that each individual human is just that, an individual with their own personal tastes and ideas, personality, we cannot deny that collective consciousness can produce a great amount of things allows us to be more productive and promotes our survival. Again, I can turn to the example of the family unit. It has been proven time and time again that a single parent household is not capable of producing the same consistent results as a two parent household. And it's very easy to understand why. When you have a mother and father who embrace their roles as male and female, you sh allow the burden of existence to be split between two capable adults. When a single father is out there in the world attempting to take care of a child, which is a natural biological motivation, they run into the issue of not being able to self-actualize. They cannot perform their best at work because they must constantly bear the responsibility by themselves of taking care of the child. Women, for example, in the single mother household, cannot fully bear the responsibilities of children because now they must take up the role that the father has and go out into the world and produce resources in order to maintain themselves and the child and whatever rest of the family unit may be involved. And it's particularly awful for women who have to bear this burden themselves because in a lot of cases they lack the personality characteristics and the physical ability to do certain things. So when you have this collective consciousness between a mother and a father, between male and female, you have the building block of society. And this collective power is much stronger than the individual mother or the individual father trying to get through life. It is a struggle and the burden has to be shared amongst them. Tenant number five is a slight tangent, however, it will make sense shortly. Hierarchy is naturally occurring and plays a vital role in determining the success of a group through evolution. The promotion of bad genes or destructive persons will only allow your society to degrade to the point in which it collapses. There needs to exist a naturally occurring hierarchy that promotes the most intelligent, the strongest, fastest, or combination of any of these things. These people must be incentivized to climb the social hierarchy 
and in particular to reproduce. This maintains the health of the society as a whole. If you understand what evolution means, the society must adapt to its environment. It must adapt to new challenges that arises. And by maintaining this natural hierarchy, you are promoting the health of the collective. The problems that we face today from liberal thought is that they do not promote natural hierarchy. They are explicitly against this. This is one of the primary reasons between the left and right political divide. The continued promotion of the weak-willed and weak-minded will only lead to a stronger and faster collapse of our society. Uh, this does not mean that I am promoting eugenics or anything like this. As I said before, it's a naturally occurring hierarchy. This is a broad discussion that needs to be had in the future, but it is a key part of maintaining a healthy society and collective. And to further clarify something here, a point of contention that you must understand is that simply collecting monetary wealth in today's society typically means for most people that that person has climbed the social hierarchy. No longer do we take into account someone's virtue or their intellect or their skill in a trade job or working with their hands. We only see capital collection as a means of measuring success. And this is simply untrue and will lead to the destruction of our society as we are seeing. People are willing to do anything to make a quick buck. They are willing to degrade the collective and destroy the society in order to achieve this capital wealth. This is not the healthy promotion or a naturally occurring hierarchy. Now we must get to the final tenant, which is tenant number six. But first, let's recap all of the other ones. Number one is the human condition and its biological motivations. Two is the inevitable conflict of nature. Three is that humans have created and maintained social norms and the abstract concept of society to promote survival of the species. Four, because of this, we understand and must recognize the power of the collective versus the power of the individual. And five, naturally occurring hierarchies are important to maintaining the health of the society. Number six is that we must recognize the power of the state in politics, the power of government as a tool for mankind to use in order to promote conflict avoidance, identity, hierarchy, and etc. This is the intended purpose of the state, and why humans throughout history have used it as a survival strategy. It's more beneficial for humans to come together collectively and form a state than live in the sort of natural state of man which is more tribal and less collective. No matter what abuses may occur within history, whether in the past, the present, or the future, we have to understand that the state is a tool and nothing more. It's the same, and I like to use this analogy, it's the same as a firearm or a gun, whatever you want to call it. Guns in and of themselves do not go around killing people. It is the man or woman behind the gun that causes the destruction, and that we must carefully choose our firearms for the tasks ahead. For example, if you wanted to go hunting rabbits, you would probably not use a rifle larger than 556 caliber because in my own personal experience there isn't much left of the rabbit when hunting with rifles of such a high caliber alternatively you would not dare go out and hunt grizzly bears with a 22 caliber pistol it's not strong enough and you will be mauled to death my rabbit hunting example is an analogy to communism where the state and left-wing governments only seek to destroy and are not useful for the purposes of survival. However, liberal social democracies are so incredibly weak, they represent the analogy of the 22 pistol and the bear, because you cannot possibly hope to defeat a bear with a 22 pistol, unless you get really lucky. Without a strong state, in my opinion, of some form, and this is a discussion to be had later, without this strong state, this strong collective power, we are only weakening ourselves and our chances of survival are much less. This is not to say that there is no use for a 22 pistol in hunting, but now is not the time. Now is not the right scenario. There may come a time and place where this may be useful, but now is not the time. Now, hopefully, if you've been on the fence about ethno-nationalism and possibly embracing right-wing politics, this has helped open your eyes a little bit to our worldview. Now, if you're already an ethno-nationalist or a right-winger and you'd like to contribute something to this thought, please leave me a comment down below, leave me a, a message on Twitter, and I've recently signed up to Gab. 
You can also find me on the Discord server linked on the channel if you want to talk more on voice. I appreciate everyone's support, and thanks for listening.